Oi! It's Brian Price. This is The Exchange on Real Vision, and I'm really pleased to be at the table today with two guests who uh, served a crucial role for us in Venezuela's state of disaster. I'm with Jay Newman, former senior portfolio manager of Elliott Management, attorney, and then also joining us is Daniel Landsberg Rodriguez, professor at Northwestern, writer, columnist for El Nacional in Venezuela, and then also somebody that served as a crucial voice within Venezuela's state of disaster. Thank you for being with us again today. And thank you for doing this, Brian. It's such an important topic to be discussing. It's been a couple of weeks since we aired on Real Vision, Venezuela's state of disaster. And in Venezuela, a few weeks is equivalent to a few years in most normal countries when it comes to developments, and in this case, tragic developments. And really what I want to do is take a step back um, and really hand the ball off to Jay to drive a lot of this conversation because um, your experience, your time, not just working in Latin America but throughout the world, I think gives us tremendous perspective. And then I think uh, your work as an academic, Daniel, will help answer some questions that we still have um, as we continue to study uh, this nation in turmoil. So I just thought I would tick through uh, the last couple of weeks of, of news in, coming out of Venezuela. So we've, we've seen Colombian criminal groups uh, attacking uh, Venezuelan security forces. We see, continue to see Venezuelan crude production in free fall, a new fight erupting over a massive oil find being exploited by Exxon in Guyana, but as to which, uh, as to which territory Venezuela has always claimed over 100 years uh, sovereignty. Chilean Air Force sending in uh, aircraft to take out, to, to remove Chileans from the country. City right across the border from uh, Venezuela and Brazil now has 10% of its population made up of Venezuelan uh, emigrants. 650,000 school children showing up for the first day of class in Colombia, Venezuelan school children showing up in Colombia for school. President of Colombia, uh, Ivan Duque asking for international action. Venezuela saying it's going to send military to the border with Colombia. Uh, AMLO, the elect, president-elect of um, Mexico, inviting Maduro to his inauguration. A UN estimate that you know more people have become refugees from Venezuela than any other country in recent memory, including Syria, three million, an exodus of three million. Venezuela running out of motor fuel and gasoline. And last but not least, uh, consumer prices rising over the last year over 800,000%. How is this in any way sustainable? Well, well, that's a tall order, Jay. Uh, the, you, you mentioned quite a bit there. Uh, and, uh, but to unpack it a little bit, sustainability is a bit of a subjective term. Uh, it's not sustainable in terms of social development. It's not sustainable in terms of uh, you know, having a country that can move forward. Uh, but it is a situation which, in some ways, the worse things get, uh, the more that strengthens Maduro. And those three million people you mentioned who have left, uh, that's on top of a lot of the middle class uh, emigrating back when there was enough money to uh, fund uh, essentially uh, Venezuela subsidized uh, through the Caribe process and the exchange rate system. Uh, study abroad essentially for free, uh, just off arbitraging currency, uh, for an entire generation of educated Venezuelans to have already left. Uh, before that, right when Chavez came in, a lot of the uh, sort of old school elite uh, had also already left. So what we're seeing now is just the latest wave. Obviously the numbers are a lot higher, but the types of people who would probably be necessary to be able to pose a real internal challenge to Maduro, uh, the technocrats uh, who would be able to plan for something better than Maduro uh, credibly, the students who would be required to shut down the universities in protest and potentially uh, provoke some kind of crisis if the government uh, holds too hard a hand against them or raises too hard a hand against them. That's uh, the, exactly the type of people who are right now most likely to be outside of the country. So you, you've, you've spoken to us before about, um, about that, about the opposition and about the, the fact that there's no, uh, no really effective internal opposition. But there is a, a, a large diaspora. There are a lot of people thinking and working toward uh, a, a Venezuela post-Maduro. What is the uh, diaspora uh, in absentia working on? 
That's, and, uh, and who are they? So, uh, I mean, the Venezuelan uh, diaspora, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, is one of the few ethnic uh, groups or groupings that it is, on average, better educated and wealthier than native-born uh, U.S. citizens. Uh, you have a, a very affluent, educated class that has been out for several years uh, that are, you know, very successful. Uh, but not particularly coordinated. And an example that I like to give uh, of how this dynamic works was a few years ago, I believe 2010, uh, when there were uh, midterm elections or legislative elections in Venezuela. Uh, and Chavez, uh, because you can vote constitutionally from outside, those votes are seldom counted before the, uh, uh, before the final uh, results are, to are uh, announced. But in theory, you have a lot of voters uh, who could cast ballots from abroad. And at this point, 2010, was when you were first starting to have diaspora numbers uh, in, 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 you know, at a level in which they may have been able to influence something like that. Uh, so uh, if the vote counter let, let them count. Yes, it's not uh, who votes, it's who counts the votes, as right. Stalin said. But uh, it's essentially uh, what Chavez did was shut down the Miami consulate. Uh, in Venezuela, which means the place that you would have had to go to vote if you lived in Miami suddenly became New Orleans. Uh, you had tens of thousands of Venezuelan diaspora organizing amongst themselves to uh, essentially organize buses, bus trips. Uh, many of them flew into New Orleans. It became almost a, uh, a social event going to New Orleans with the rest of the diaspora or with a critical mass of the Miami diaspora to go vote, uh, you know, several states away. Uh, that is an really a, a, a potent symbolic gesture. Uh, but at the end of the day, the expenditures of flying into New Orleans, getting a hotel, what you're going to spend on food uh, while there, on chartering that bus, uh, on Ubering to and from the bus station or airport. So is, that, so is that effort, you mentioned symbolic, is that just rich people having a party or are they actually accomplishing something in terms of uh, developing a plan and effectuating a plan to get rid of Maduro and to bring in a new regime. Well, that's the issue. There, were, there was a so there's so the interest is there and the resources are there. What uh, I have not sensed yet is real coordination. Partially, this has to do, I think, with a the fact that the Venezuelan opposition in Venezuela is so atomized into essentially warring tribes, and that's one of the reasons that Maduro, despite being uh, the most unpopular president uh, in a polling sense that Venezuela has had uh, in its recent history, uh, has still been able to survive because the opposition uses a lot of its energy fighting internally uh, to be the uh, sort of to dominate the opposition uh, rather than to actually confront Maduro. Uh, this creates a situation where the diaspora, many of them have loyalties to various uh, leaders within the opposition or to various parties within the umbrella of the opposition, uh, but they're not really coordinating well internally. On top of that, you have a phenomenon, I'd say, which is largely psychological, uh, which is a little bit that once you leave Venezuela, once you emigrate, uh, you've, you know, there's a sense from the people who have stayed that you've kind of given up. Uh, and I think that that psychological barrier has been really unfortunate because the opposition and the, dia or the diaspora is the one resource that the opposition for years has, in theory, been able to count on that the government doesn't have. The government has more money, it has better arms, uh, it has uh, constitutional control, it has the courts. Uh, the one thing that the opposition had, they haven't really been able to mobilize uh, beyond uh, grand symbolic gestures like the rejection of the uh, referendum that we saw last year, uh, in which many more millions voted uh, against a referendum uh, from abroad uh, in a symbolic non-binding vote than actually voted for the referendum uh, candidates uh, for the, uh, 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 the Assemblée Nationale, the, uh, the, uh, not, not a referendum, sorry, the uh, Constituent Assembly. Uh, so that, I think, is, uh, you know, you have a lot of examples in which more coordination of these resources and of these groups would be vital. That said, uh, you know, what, what, what is missing, and to go back to your initial point, 
uh, about how sustainable is this is a flashpoint. Uh, you know, it's the type of situation in which Maduro is sitting on a powder keg. Uh, the gunpowder is damp, but uh, a big enough flash and it would go off in, in, in spectacular fashion. And the fact that a majority of the country now opposes Maduro, and it's a pretty significant majority, and that's not even counting the people who have already voted with their feet, which as you mentioned is uh, uh, unprecedented uh, for a country of Venezuela's size in the modern era, uh, you know, that's something that a, a will come back to haunt the government. So it's, it's, been, it's been reported um, lately, and just trying to get your sense whether this is real and meaningful, that um, the opposition, some of the opposition are taking the view that uh, because Maduro was elected, he's a uh, legitimate president acting in illegitimate ways, but come the inauguration early next year, he will become an illegitimate president, someone who stole an election, acting in illegitimate ways. Is this, is this distinction real? Is it meaningful? One of the tragedies of Venezuela is that it's a country that has had 26 constitutions in 200 years and is now working on its 27th. So the idea of a constitutional precedent or of, I mean, the constitution is what the judges say it is at any given time. And as long as Maduro controls the judges. And there are judges inside the country and outside the country that true. are both ruling on. What the judges inside the country think mm -hmm. uh, is what usually carries the day. Uh, so whereas, Symbolically, uh, I think that that can make a, a real difference. And in terms of how the international community responds to Maduro could also make a pretty uh, substantial difference. Uh, the problem is, I think, that the geopolitical moment internationally in which these issues are coming to a head is also a particularly divisive one. I think if Maduro had been doing what Maduro is doing now in the mid-2000s or the early 90s, he would have been able to draw significantly more criticism. Uh, but right now you have the left in essentially open retreats throughout much of a continent that it dominated for the last decade. Uh, and that means that even comparatively moderate leftists, at least uh, compared to Maduro, uh, such as uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia or AMLO, who you mentioned well, in the original question. Let's, um, let's talk about AMLO for a second, because mm -hmm. you say the, the left is in retreat, but uh, not in Mexico. And AMLO is, is taking a number of steps that suggest uh, he is the left, and the left is uh, resurgent in Mexico. And he just invited Maduro to come to his inauguration, which puts him at odds with uh, most other uh, presidents in Latin America. A great point. Uh, I would say Mexico has a long-standing tendency to sort of march to the beat of, its, of a different drummer. Uh, they were the only country uh, back in the 50s and 60s that didn't uh, it, it turn their back on Cuba. Uh, despite JFK going personally to Mexico City to argue the point, who was a tremendously popular, charismatic, and Catholic uh, president visiting Latin America. Uh, on top of that, uh, you have them inviting a Habsburg to come rule them at a time when the rest of the continent was uh, you know, very vehement about not wanting European monarchies. Uh, so Mexico tends to be a little bit atypical. That said, I would argue that Mexico is not really a case of the left resurgent. It's a case of the center imploding. Uh, Mexicans elected the same candidate uh, who they had already rejected twice uh, by a huge margin when he stopped campaigning as a leftist and started campaigning as an anti-establishment outsider. And yet he did, he has invited Maduro to his inauguration, which mm -hmm. is a, uh, uh, is that just symbolic or is that, is that significant in terms of developing a geopolitical consensus uh, that might even lead to intervention in Venezuela, military intervention? It's not a great look. Uh, especially with some of the other things you mentioned that are going on, like the, uh, you know, the, uh, the scrapping of the uh, Naim Airport project. And uh, on top of that, you have uh, you know, these, uh, the, the, the recent uh, discomforting statements about potentially pushing on the banking sector to cancel certain fees, uh, which would be a sort of a very early populist uh, you know, handbook step in mm -hmm. uh, putting the banking sector in its place, which is very worrying for uh, investors. At the same time, Mexico has never been a, str I mean, Mexico logically 
should be the leader of Latin America. It is by far the, the only country bigger than Mexico in economic and population terms, doesn't speak the same language and had a different colonial experience. Mexico should be Latin America's leader. And this is a old Samuel Huntington ar argument. Uh, the reason it's not is because it is, it has sort of opted to be more in the US sphere historically. So Mexico has traditionally not played a very strong role in Latin American affairs uh, by choice. That began to change in the latter days of the Peña Nieto administration. And Mexico started under Videray, uh, started taking a much more active role than it ever had in recent but, memory. But, but could you imagine a, um, a situation in which there is a, uh, a, an international uh, interest in military intervention? I and mean, we already have fights at the border between Venezuela and Colombia, even if the Colombians are, in fact, um, uh, drug dealers. But is it possible to have a, an intervention without Mexico on board? I think it would be. Uh, Mexico, because they've tended to be outside of the system for a very long time, or usually uh, you know, have historically tended to vote with the US, uh, it's a bit of a special case. Now, if you didn't have Brazil on board, that would be a different story. If you didn't have Colombia on board, that would be a different story. And what, and what um, is, so we have a new president in in Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, Bolsonaro, and what has he expressed a view on uh, what's happening and what needs to happen in Venezuela? He, I mean, he's made several comments that have not been, uh, let's say, uh, sane uh, within the realms of sanity. They have, a, a certain they have point. not been particularly uh, uh, generous to the regime in Caracas. That said, uh, during the election, despite the fact that uh, Roraima, which was the uh, region you mentioned, which is actually, so Roraima is, there's a Venezuelan side of Roraima and there's a Brazilian side. Uh, it's sort of a jungle border. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the local government in Roraima, the congressmen and the uh, city officials in Roraima and state officials have been having a heck of a time for months. Uh, because as you said, you have uh, been uh, the equivalent of 10% of the population. And it's not a very populated region or a very developed one. Uh, and a lot of these people are And being, they speak different languages. And they speak different languages, which used to actually shield Brazil from a lot of the problems that would come hand in hand with having uh, neighbors that were often destabilized. Uh, you know, if Colombia breaks down, they're going to go to Venezuela, not Brazil. And for a long time, the sort of uh, reverse assumption also held. The situation in Venezuela has gotten to a point now where the only barriers are really ideological. Venezuelans aren't escaping to Cuba. Venezuelans aren't escaping to Bolivia uh, because they're scared uh, to basically go to a similar country. Uh, but I mean, in Ecuador, I think, ironically, is a little bit shielded by that as well. But the language barrier, which used to be something that protected Brazil, uh, has not been doing so. In the, during the election, up until now, Venezuela was not a big topic of conversation, I think because of the internal politics within Brazil. Uh, the right, uh, championed by Bolsonaro, uh, were already being accused of uh, you know, being too radically right-wing, of xenophobia at times, of racism, uh, and so coming down too hard on a uh, large refugee population in public wouldn't have necessarily been something that uh, would assuage some of these concerns among the moderates that he was trying to appeal to, especially given that the left ran a, a comparatively moderate candidate. The left, who would usually be the ones who would latch on to a human rights issue, especially against a candidate like Bolsonaro, also didn't want to bring the issue to the forefront because the PT, uh, which is the largest party on the left and the one that fielded the main candidate uh, this time around, uh, Lula and Chavez were quite close, at least publicly. You know, there was a lot of photo ops. Uh, they have been defending Venezuela throughout. So, the, so both sides, I think, had a, took a consort, uh, I mean, took an in independent decision that Venezuela should not be a major topic of conversation. That may now change uh, now that the election is behind them. Uh, and I think that the interactions between Ivan Duque in Colombia and uh, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil will be something that Venezuela will have to worry about considerably. There's been a lot of conversation about um, uh, sanctions and the use of sanctions by the Trump administration, the increasing use of them as kind of flip and flip on, flip off uh, elements of foreign policy. Uh, in, in the context of Venezuela, though, the, it shades over into amnesty and the fact that there are so many people uh, that have engaged in wholesale corruption over a very long period of time in Venezuela, 
that are now under sanctions, uh, that in order to get anything moving, sanctions will have to be listed and there will probably need to be an amnesty. How is the man on the street likely to react to that? So that's, uh, I mean, that's a, a weighty question. Uh, on, the, on the sanctions being used flippantly, I think that that, as, as, as you implied, uh, very much can negate the importance of sanctions. If sanctions are just like a bad hair day, uh, that then you can you know, comb your hair the next day and be fine, uh, you know, that's obviously going to take some of the teeth away from them as a tool for US foreign policy. I think in Venezuela, it, it might actually be bad for Maduro to have sanctions used in this way uh, for a very particular reason. Uh, the Venezuelan regime, or you know, the, the coalition, uh, as to use the word generously, that right now backs Maduro, uh, have very different interests. And in the old days, what kept them together was essentially sacking the state. Uh, because you would have preferential access to things like exchange, uh, to foreign exchange. You would have preferential uh, access to, uh, you know, corruption, uh, over invoicing, uh, you know, the ability to maybe police a particular border that a lot of smuggling traffic came through that you could sort of informally tax. I mean, there were ways in which you could basically buy people off uh, through policy because there was no oversight. So with everything in mind, that you guys have been discussing. I just want to jump in for a minute and broaden it out globally and take a look at one of the big G's in gold and the role that that's playing both domestically in Venezuela and then the relationship it dictates with other countries. What are you seeing? So gold is a very interesting uh, issue in Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela has gold. Uh, they've never really gotten production uh, truly online formally. Uh, which is a similar case to diamonds, actually, which Venezuela also has, uh, but which it's never, you know, I, I think uh, Chavez had a fight with the Kimberley people in 2008 and Venezuela got decertified and has remained so. Uh, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been, uh, you know, an industrialization, a uh, very powerful industrialization. I mean, if you go on Google Maps now and, to, and look at areas uh, where, of Venezuela, uh, where, you know, th these resources are present, you can actually see what's, what mines but uh, they're not formal mines, they're informal mines. Uh, the government is known, well, is, 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 is widely presumed to take a cut of this, uh, and that's something that has, you know, facilitated, uh, you know, it's, it, the diversification, the de facto diversification of its income. Because when people tell you that 98% of, or 99% now, of uh, Venezuela's exports are uh, oil, uh, that's not technically true. 99% of the exports that Venezuela, uh, a, a, let's say, legitimately exports are oil. But on top of that, you have to include drugs, most of which are not grown in Venezuela, uh, but which pass through there. Uh, it includes oil, it includes diamonds, uh, many of which are smuggled out uh, at, you know, obviously a lower price because it's smuggled, uh, but the government gets a big cut of it. Uh, and unlike conventional private sector, you can basically pick who's getting them. Uh, so whoever uh, is being allowed access to these sorts of illicit resources uh, will, uh, you know, for survival's sake, be a lot more amenable to the government, uh, regardless of how they uh, attempt to interfere or else uh, risk losing their, uh, you know, their access. That said, uh, the other place that gold comes into play strongly is in terms of the national reserves, uh, which should be booming, uh, and which even a uh, you know unresponsible country would probably have managed to save uh, a significant amount during the uh, colossal uh, oil bonanza of the 2000s and early 2010s. Uh, Venezuela does not have that. Uh, they have a bit more of a, of a kitchen sink apparatus uh, as the Federal Reserve. So you have uh, less than 10 billion uh, US in there, uh, most of it illiquid, much of it in gold. Uh, and uh, for a while, there was a lot of speculation about whether the gold actually existed until they uh, invited a uh, 
well-known Venezuelan economist living abroad who, uh, uh, you know, to actually go look at the gold and uh, actually, uh, you know, certify that it was there for investors. Uh, that said, the gold is something that has been uh, sort of hawked uh, to multiple groups at various times, and the chain of ownership is, as with all things Venezuela, very complex at this point uh, because they have been using the gold in the reserves as, as an asset to facilitate credit. Uh, for years, uh, and it's not really clear who has taken them up on it. Uh, one of the ways in which, in the past, they have attempted to shore up uh, their credit, which is not very good, uh, because they do have the unfortunate tendency to expropriate and to decide not to pay people, uh, and to uh, say they've paid people when they haven't, uh, because of their international reputation, one of the things they did several years ago was to actually uh, export the gold uh, to a third party uh, so that ostensibly they couldn't just renege on it. And so you have a large portion of the gold or a significant portion of the gold which ended up in the UK, uh, which Maduro has now asked for back, uh, citing his own reasons and the humanitarian crisis that he caused, but he doesn't mention the latter part, um, and which is good marketing, a rare bit of good marketing for this regime, and uh, asked for it back and uh, Britain has demurred. Uh, which in among regime sympathizers has drawn uh, parallels to the Elgin Marbles uh, and said, oh, that's just Britain being Britain. They always do this. Why did we send them the gold? Uh, and, but for, I think, the international community, it does make a statement that, uh, you know, you are not, you know, you're, you're too drunk right now. You can't have your keys back <laughs> until you sober up a little bit. And uh, it doesn't really, uh, I, I'm bearish on Maduro sobering mm -hmm. up anytime soon. Are there any key dates coming up? Are there any inflection points? Uh, the, you know, we, we have Maduro uh, attending Obrador's um, uh, inauguration. We have his investiture for his next term. Do these dates matter, or are they just more uh, uh, days on a continuum? Venezuela was supposed to have a presidential election in December of this year. Uh, it would be coming up right now. Uh, that election ended up taking place in, uh, in April. First it was moved to May, then April, uh, to exploit a particular moment of opposition weakness. If you can move a presidential election uh, by over six months to a time when it's most convenient and the courts and the electoral authorities will blindly back you, essentially at this point, uh, I mean, the Constitution is not even you know, written in pencil. It's written in sand <laughs> with a finger or like on lipstick uh, on a mirror. I mean, it's very, very, uh, you know, it, it can be a guideline, uh, but basically it's, uh, you know, it's, Liquid. A very, very, I mean, it's much more liquid than the National Reserve. Yeah. Like, far more liquid. Yeah, I mean, it's it. essentially a Wikipedia, like, it's a Wikipedia, a wiki constitution that Maduro can just sort of, you know, log in and then change whatever he wants and there's no reviewers. So, uh, you know, when the dates matter, uh, actually, I would say, is less about key dates and more about key moments or, or periods of time. So for example, uh, December. Venezuelan governments for a long time have tended to give bad news in December, right before the Christmas holiday, uh, because everybody leaves the urban centers for the beach. Uh, the one thing that Maduro hasn't been able to really screw up yet is the weather. Uh, which is quite wonderful in December, uh, and people leave the urban areas and go somewhere else, somewhere nicer. Uh, as on top of that, uh, students are not in school, uh, and uh, this is more so of a... So no one's paying attention? No one's paying attention, and on top of that, the people who would usually protest first are university students, because they're all together every day, and they love missing class. <laughs> so convincing people to go protest instead of going to class, and I speak, speaking as a university professor, um, that's, uh, you know, that's a much easier sell than don't go to the beach <laughs> so that you can stay in Caracas and protest. So I would expect that in December, any bad news that the government has to give. And we saw this a little bit when they started talking about restructuring the bonds after having paid uh, the, the principal, which seems very illogical in terms of, well, if you're going to stop paying, if you're going to default, why throw several billion dollars at a principal payment first uh, and then default on interest? That makes no sense until you think about the fact that the bond came due in November uh, the actual uh, announcements that they might stop paying came in December at the key moment 
where you would usually not have. And, and this doesn't always work. I mean, you did have a coup in late January. Uh, but by and large, and you had two in February, that's, that's another particular time. Uh, Venezuelan coups tend to happen right after Christmas, in part in, ter in response to the terrible news that was given before. But there's several weeks in which it can be processed by the population. Uh, so things like devaluations, uh, those almost always, you know, historically uh, have been undertaken or been announced in December right before the holiday. Does, does Maduro go out? And I was thinking as you were talking about the beach, I was thinking, does Maduro go to the beach? Does Maduro go out? Does he have any idea what's going on in the country? So one of the interesting things that has happened in Venezuela recently, uh, especially as traditional media has been either co-opted or shut down or denied paper, uh, and it's something that also mirrors uh, a larger phenomenon that's occurring throughout the region, uh, has been the rise of social networking and uh, especially WhatsApp. And uh, you get a lot of pictures, videos of a lot of senior Chavistas traveling, uh, going to the beach. Uh, uh, I believe Diosdado Cabello, uh, who's another of the uh, most important regime leaders, his wife was actually Minister of, Minister of Tourism for a while. Uh, so they got to take some great vacations. Um, Maduro less so. Uh, he, he's not a chap who really seems to be enjoying his job. Uh, I don't think he particularly loves the presidency right now. Uh, it's probably more trouble than it's worth, save for the fact that there is no exit plan that doesn't involve uh, being, I, you know, best case scenario, locked up in The Hague or exiled uh, to Cuba until change comes to Cuba, uh, or being hung up uh, in Plaza Venezuela with piano wire. I mean, there's no real middle ground. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, he's, that said, there are few moments of fun, and you showed it in the first Real Vision uh, documentary, uh, his salsa lesson, uh, which was uh, you know, very uh, popular uh, for a while. He was in Turkey for a while, uh, and uh, there were some, some great pictures that uh, came out of him uh, and, uh, and his uh, wife, the first lady. Um, dressed and uh, you know at, at sort of a belly dancing uh, costume event. Uh, the issue is that there's always a backlash whenever he seems to be having fun, uh, which does not seem fun, but seems more than fair given the fact that uh, he has been put in charge now for the better part of a decade of a 30 million of his countrymen, many of whom don't have food, many of whom don't have money that can actually be used uh, because of hyperinflation, uh, people who are no longer fleeing the country on airplanes as in times past, but who are fording rivers on foot, uh, going through jungle to countries whose language they don't speak. Uh, so in the list of Venezuelans who I feel sorry for, uh, Maduro, despite his limited vacationing options, uh, is, is, is relatively uh, low priority at this stage. So if history is any indication, it seems we're going to be getting more bad news towards the end of the year. News is tricky in Venezuela, though. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, Chavez did quite well uh, was that he was a devil dressed up as a clown. The news that filtered out of Venezuela for years was more focused on the type of, I can't believe this shit, magical realism. Uh, and, and Maduro played to that a little bit. I mean, when he talked to uh, Chavez's uh, shade in the form of a bird, for example, mm. uh, I think that there's actually a logic to this because when you are a joke, you are not really to be feared. You're a joke. And that's something that I think you can see a lot of really terrible genocidal dictators like the Kim family uh, have actually managed to exploit this quite well. Uh, that if you get a ridiculous haircut uh, and you say ridiculous things and you do ridiculous things, foreign media is going to attach to that. So one of the big changes that I think bodes well for a transition to Venezuela, maybe not now, but in the not too distant future, uh, is the fact that for the last year and a half, and as someone who's written quite a bit for press, I remember when if you were pitching a Venezuelan story to an editor, they wanted to know where the, where's the funny, essentially. You know, where is the part where you focus on how 
you know, crazy insane <laughs> these guys are. Uh, and when you tried to do a human interest story about how much people were suffering, that had to be packaged into, oh, well, Maduro used a body double that didn't look like him at a Panama summit. Isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. Now that's no longer the case. Uh, I think that Venezuela has gone from unfunny Shakespeare comedy to Shakespeare tragedy to Dante's Inferno, and the media is actually tracking this quite closely internationally. That is an important change, and that does create a scenario that Maduro does not, uh, that is new for Maduro, and that he can't simply copy off Chavez, because Chavez was seen as a buffoon, he was seen as a joke uh, internationally, but he was rarely seen as a threat. Uh, Maduro now, uh, with the uh, mass exodus of his people destabilizing his neighbors, uh, defaulting uh, on the rest of the world, uh, with the humanitarian crisis getting more and more press internationally from both left-wing and right-wing media, uh, The Guardian, for example, that backed Chavez like clockwork for the entire time he was president, even when he was jailing opponents uh, because of ideological reasons, is no longer backing Maduro. Uh, the, or the people who I used to see, there was always you know, four or five pundits who were the regime supporters who spoke English that would be on every single television show uh, as the debate as the people defending the revolution, they're down essentially to one person at this point. Uh, you know, and, and he has, you know, he's booked everywhere. Uh, but it, you know, people who were seen as real stalwarts have jumped ship. Uh, internationally, it's, you know, people have accepted that the indefensible can't be defended. Uh, and that is a seed change. Well, I think on the note of the important, the crucial role that the media plays, in exposing this clown is a good note to end I'm on. I'm looking at you, Brian. I'm trying to do it. Thank you. I'm trying to do it <laughs> along with you guys, because I think it's stories like these that need to be told. And as long as this suffering continues, Maduro and those folks need to be held accountable. So it was a pleasure working with both of you um, on the last project. And I'm so glad that we were able to put this follow-up together today. Here, here.